you get mentioned in my name. We don't like what you say. I don't give a fuck. Y'all can suck my dick. So what I really want to show you in this demo is some code that I've used to prevent incredibly long blocking chains that are a result of your running SP recompile. Now if you want to create some scenarios to play with this code and, and test against it, the pseudocode that I've created here goes against the member table and I'll show you where you'd have to make modifications to it and, and play with this. But I think you might end up finding this really useful if you ever have to do an SP recompile in the middle of a day and you, you don't want to create an incredibly long blocking scenario. The SP recompile might not take effect right away because it's going to kind of do some interesting things to not create blocking. So it, again, if you want to play around with this, go ahead and, and re-restore credit from your modified version of that script. And then let me explain this pseudo code for you. It, it's really code that does a couple of things. It's going to, when you're going to do an SP recompile, it's going to first look at whether or not there's any currently running statements or transactions from users that have been running for a certain period of time. And the idea is really this, don't even try to get into the queue with that schema mod lock unless there aren't any long running operations. And, and you can define inside of this code what I mean by a long running operation. So you could say something like, I don't want to even attempt to get into the queue if there have been or there are currently any queries that have been running for 30 seconds or more. And so there's a place inside the code where you'll actually say where the last request start time is more than 30 seconds seconds ago, right? So you would end up first setting this and this says, okay, I want the schema mod lock, but is there anybody that's been running for more than 30 seconds? And if the answer is yes, then essentially we kind of step out, we don't get into the queue, and then we go, how about now? How about now? How about now? So this actually acts very much like a, a spin lock where we're not grabbing the resource and holding it. We're kind of going, should I grab the resource? Should I grab the resource? How about now? How about now? How about now? How about now? And we'll just kind of be sitting there spinning our wheels until there's no long running queries. Now, once we meet the criteria that there's no operation that's been running for more than 30 seconds, then the second part of my code is going to essentially kick in, which is we're going to get into the queue. But if we don't actually succeed and get our schema mod lock, then we're going to get back out of the queue. So it's more like this. Is there anybody long running? Is there anybody long running? Is there anybody long running? And once we determine that, no, there's nobody long running, then we jump in the queue and we give it a couple of seconds. And if we don't actually finish, because maybe a long running query started and it had only been running for 10 seconds, so it didn't meet our long running criteria. So we jumped into the queue, but now it's at 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And if we stayed in the queue, then everybody else would be waiting behind us. So this second part is, okay, if there's nobody that meets the criteria when I jump into the queue, if I don't actually succeed, then you know what? I'm going to jump back out of the queue. And the way that I'm going to do this is by setting a lock timeout. Lock timeout is a way to basically say if I don't acquire my lock within a certain number of milliseconds, in this case 2,000 milliseconds is 2 seconds, then that says I am going to give up. There is no lock timeout for a lock that's held. The only way to get rid of locks that you hold is to complete your transaction or have your transaction rolled back. But in the attempt of a lock, if you don't achieve that lock within a certain period of time, you can time that out. So what we're going to actually do is set our lock timeout, and I'll, I'll scroll a little bit further. Again, these are all comments, but you can see right at the beginning, I set my lock timeout, and then a little bit later in my code, and I'll show you this that's where I set the amount of time that we're going to wait. Now the last thing that's kind of interesting is I'm going to also have you set a number of retries and you might even want to set that up really high. Like 
you'll let this code try thousands of times, but you can also set a maximum amount of runtime that the code will run in its entirety. So you might say, okay, this code can run for 60 minutes and I'll give it, you know, 10,000, some exorbitant number of retries. It will never get to 10,000, but you know, you might set that number up really high, let it run for an hour, and over that hour, what's basically going to happen is if there's anything long running, we won't get in the queue. If there's a lull in the long running operations, we'll get in the queue, but if we don't succeed within two seconds, we step back out and we go, How about now? How about now? How about now? And if again there's no long running operations, we step back in the queue, and again, within two seconds, if we don't get it, we step back out. So this is really just a way for you to kind of create what SQL 2014 introduced for only a small number of operations, essentially something called a low priority lock weight. What I'm essentially trying to do is make this schema mod lock low priority, right? I don't want it to block everybody and become the highest priority thing on your table. I want to like look at your table and say, Hmm, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. Oh, it's starting to look good. Jump in the queue. Darn, it wasn't good enough. Get back out. And then I start looking again, looking again, and I will give the entire operation 60 seconds to run. So the way that I do that, like I said, is you'll set your lock timeout. Okay, so that you'll set right away. Set it as two seconds, something fairly low. Then you might want to set your retries to something really high. I have it set down low here for you to play around with and, and testing. So you'd set your retries to be low. You'd set your current retry to be zero. And then you can see that I'm using some go-to labels. It's not the uh, sexiest of code, but it's about the only way that you can bounce around as much as I'm doing here. So this part of the code right here, and you could play around with this, is checking the table that you're interested in, so dbo.member, and then here is where you're saying there can't be anything that's more than 30 seconds. So if I get a count of locks from currently running sessions that's greater than zero, for locks that have been held for more than 30 seconds, then I'm not going to do anything, right? I'm basically going to, I'm going to wait, and then I'm going to check to see after my one millisecond wait, I'm going to check to see if I'm still within the bounds of my maximum runtime. And if I'm not, I'm going to end up saying we give up. Otherwise, I'm going to keep checking. How about now? How about now? How about now? How about now? So this is the code that's kind of the how about now? Now, once we get past this, if our count ends up being zero for locks that have been held for more than 30 seconds, right, then we're going to come down and try to do SP recompile. And you might think, well, where's the code that's going to catch that if we can't get our lock within two seconds? And that's the whole benefit of putting this whole thing in a try catch block. So this is really this entire chunk here, begin try. This is what we're going to try to do. And if this doesn't succeed, and why wouldn't it succeed? Because of our lock timeout. So if this doesn't actually succeed within two seconds, our lock timeout kicks in, gives us a message, that's where we catch that, and then we have to do a few things. Now the first thing that I do is I say if there's a transaction, roll it back. And that, I really don't want you to have that in a lot of your code, but unfortunately, depending on what the maintenance operation is, like an SP recompile, you might end up finding that internally that begins a transaction and a lock timeout, even though you get that error, a lock timeout only kills the statement, not the transaction. So I have to make sure that that transaction is not left pending. Then, do we have a retry? How much time do we have left? And if we don't have any time left, I've got some messages in here. Could not obtain a lock in a timely manner. Retry attempt, whatever of whatever. And then I spit that back out to the client. Right, And if the current retries are less than my total number of retries allowed, I go back and I look at the queue again. How about now? How about now? How about now? Now, if I've exhausted all of my retries, then I've got another scenario here where we say could not obtain a lock in a timely manner, retries failed, and I output that back, and we're pretty much done. 
We end our catch. I have my giving up where we just set our lock timeout back to the infinite default lock timeout. And that's the end of the code. But this is something that you can put essentially as a wrapper around that SP recompile event so that you end up not creating massively long blocking chains. And let me just scroll up one last time. I don't think I showed you this message. This message, if you can't get the lock, this is another one where I'm just saying giving up, could not gain access to the table, too many long running operations. So these are just messages. You can set the raise error to be anything you want. You could put this one as foo and the next one as bar. But one of the cool things that I did, and I think this is helpful for you to see as well, is parameterized raise error. I think this is something you should definitely be using. And you can set your raise error messages to a variety of different levels. Level 10 is a warning message. So if you end up putting this into a job, then you'll be able to see all those level 10 messages essentially as informational output of what happened when you tried to do, for example, that SP recompile. So this is, I, I think, really fun code for you to look at and get some insight into and spend some time kind of playing around with. But I wouldn't say it's directly related to everything that we're doing in recompilation. But if you need to do an SP recompile, I would definitely be a little bit hesitant to do that in a 24-7, 365 environment because it could create a horrible blocking chain. So this code will definitely help you out to reduce that problem.